Hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, welcome on behalf of the Architectural League and LOG to this um, special program on expanding modes of practice. I'm Rosalie Ginevra, the Executive Director of the League. I hope you're all doing okay and managing to cope in this very difficult time and to at least occasionally find some moments of um, pleasure. Um, we're Tonight was supposed to be um, a First Friday, um, a League First Friday event at WXY, um, but we are happy to be able to connect in this alternate way. Um, we certainly look forward to the time when we're gonna be able to come together in person again, but for tonight and for the next couple of months, we're gonna experiment with this format and I'm sure we'll be able to find some pleasures and strengths um, in this way of doing things. We're really delighted to be able to partner on tonight's event with LOG. LOG's editor is Cynthia Davidson and um, guest editor for this new issue called Expanding Modes of Practice, Bryony e. Roberts. Um, we responded immediately when we asked if they would like to collaborate on presenting a joint program on some of the themes of the issue. And that worked perfectly with finding a new way to explore some of the structure and strategies of WXY's practice. So I wanna emphasize that this is an experiment, a first time for us using this particular format. We, like many of you, um, have been on dozens of Zoom meetings over the last few weeks, um, but a Zoom webinar is new to us and we hope you'll bear with us as we try this out. A big thank you to the League's program director, Anne Rieselbach, and to League staff members, Katerina Flaxman, Katie Rotman, Nanase Shirakawa, and Daniel Chiofi for very quickly putting this program together and figuring out the technology. And again, to Cynthia Davidson for her quick enthusiasm and support for this event. Now I wanna introduce Claire Weiss and Adam Lubinsky of WXY, who will do a short presentation of some of the practices work and who will then be joined by Bryony Roberts, who's the guest editor of issue 48 of LOG, the winter spring 2020 issue. Claire and Adam, I think are probably familiar names to many of you. Claire and Mark Yost founded the predecessor firm to WXY in 1998 and were joined in the practice by Lang Pugh in 2006 and by Adam in 2011. The firm is now about 50 people who have backgrounds in planning, engineering, landscape architecture, and graphic design as well in ar as architecture. Bryony e. Roberts has a design and research practice called Bryony e. Roberts Studio and also teaches design studio and seminars at GSAP at Columbia. She received her Master of Architecture degree from Princeton and she has a long list of awards for her design and scholarly work, including being one of the winners of the Architectural League Prize for Young Architects and Designers in 2018. So let's get started. Over to you, Claire and Adam. Great, thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm Adam Lubinsky, uh, Managing Principal at WXY, and I'm here with Claire Weiss, who's the founding principal of WXY, uh, and we're excited to spend the evening with you. Um, this is where we all would have been if this were a regular uh friday and the plan that we had with the architectural league for a first friday um but of course this is not a time of uh, business as usual um there are as rosalie said about 50 of us that work in usual conditions up in this space and we also have small offices in washington dc and chicago but of course now um this is how we're operating this is our office um, we are all working remotely, as I'm sure many of you are. Um, and I also want to recognize, as Rosalie did, that there are many others who are still working in spaces as essential workers. So this is a really intense emotional time to be talking about work um, and talking about New York City and talking about our practice. Um, you know, the process of developing these remote systems of working has been a real challenge for us and it's made us really reflective even in just three weeks um, about our practice uh, both how we work internally but also how we are facing the word the world externally you know our our work uh you know with design is also very focused on uh, engagement 
And so all of these stresses on how we talk to each other and how we work to, with each other is critical to our practice. And so, and Claire, if you take us on to the next slide, um, you know, our um, streets are changing um, as we speak. And, you know, we pulled this very uh, famous quote from Jane Jacobs um, talking about eyes up the street. But what we wanted to emphasize here is not the first part of the quote, which everyone's familiar with, but the second half of the quote, which talks about the eyes and who they belong to. And the, this idea that the eyes are belonging to those who we might call the natural proprietors of the street. And I think for us, um, that's a kind of lost part of the quote, um, because part of what we're trying to do in our practice is really bring everybody into the frame and try and work on plans and on designs as if everybody were natural proprietors. And, you know, particularly as we shift into this crisis and thinking beyond this crisis, uh, how we all feel a sense of ownership and trust going out into the public realm, um, it's going to be increasingly important that um, there is a sense of social cohesion. And so our practice um, is really bound up uh, both in planning and design um, with engagement. And um, there are some real basic challenges in terms of how to do engagement, how to do it well. Um, and some of it has to do with uh, language. Some of it has to do with childcare, uh, with the timing of events and with the ease of communication. And so, and Claire, you can take us on to the next slide. Really finding these kinds of mechanisms, which here they're analog um, and accessible and increasingly having to figure out how um, these tools can also be virtual and digital. And we're spending an enormous amount of time thinking about those practices now and even starting to implement them in different places in New York City and elsewhere. And so, you know, looking into this one very basic aspect of this, and this is a slide from our work uh, in District 15 in Brooklyn, uh, where we were working with the Department of Education on how to uh, look at school diversity and integrating the middle schools of this district, um, really working on visual communications and seeing design as a critical tool for talking not just about spatial dynamics, but about policy issues. Um, you know, really, really integrating uh, uh, accessible graphics as a way to communicate with all uh, sorts of parents and kids, students and, and guardians across that area. And then looking to the next slide, um, not just thinking about how engagement is done with people and making it accessible and transparent, but also looking at how um, uh, planning processes themselves are being uh, conducted. And so this graphic is from our work uh, on the East Harlem neighborhood plan, which dates back about three and a half years, where um, shortly after the mayor um, announced his mandatory inclusionary housing policy, he talked about rezoning a number of neighborhoods. And in the case of East Harlem, um, the neighborhood beyond, behind uh, Melissa Mark Viverito decided they were gonna do their own neighborhood plan first and then turn that plan over to city planning. And all of the recommendations that came through that neighborhood plan were done on the basis of a steering committee, similar to the District 15 diversity, uh, school diversity plan, where there was a kind of working group that made decisions. So really thinking about engagement, not just as a way to bring people into processes, but how to change the nature of the processes themselves. Um, so I'll turn over to Claire now to think about that pivot from planning processes to design processes. So, you know, just reflecting back on the 
kind of diagram that Adam showed, what I think was a game changer for us with the East Harlem Community Plan was that it represented um, how important it is sometimes just not to um, make kind of not make everyone happy or sad or whatever. It's not about that with engagement. It might actually, the process itself might actually be about these, uh, this idea of more people being able to lead their communities and using the process as a tool for really their own um, kind of creation of new organizations, of new opportunities. And that is an interesting thing relative to the moment we're in. And, and I'm showing you a picture of the Rockaway Boardwalk, which was also a moment where community engagement wasn't really taken for granted and was actually a very difficult thing to do because people couldn't get into their homes. They were having power disruptions. And at the same time, there was a huge need to kind of try and figure out how to restore community. So even though we're in a moment when we're spending a lot of time figuring out how to create virtual communities and, and virtual digital public space, I think we have to recognize that the environment itself is providing, is going to be the place that really provides uh, and has, will always provide a kind of that sense of place, something really important. And I think the Log Magazine that, um, let's see if I can, whoops, I knew my technical, okay. So that was just, you know, a, it didn't always look like, things don't always look or act like they are today. And I think we're looking currently at maybe an invisible disaster, but when you see the pictures of all the empty streets and all the empty places, in a lot of ways, it's, it's not d different than a physical disruption, but it's a huge disruption. And the idea of the capacity of linking planning and spatial and architectural um, uh, imagination to really engage with people at the level of opportunity, not just at the level of image or not just at the level of investment or you know one job at a time, but how do you bring all of those issues of economics, of um, opportunity of environment together. And I think that's still the important part about uh, what we all do. And here's like just some pictures of that. So in general, I was sort of, we've been doing a lot of reflecting about how our work as a whole, what's actually important about places, even when the places, people have to be socially distanced and the places have to be for one person and I keep being reminded about Eric Kleinenberg's work and all of the work he does about how some of the people who are to live alone and are actually the one that are most engaged and in their communities and in helping others. So I think I wanted to leave it to that and, and give this off to Brian. Thank you, Claire. Um, and thank you, Claire and Adam, both for sharing your work and giving us a glimpse into your process. Um, thanks also to the Architecture League for organizing this event series. It's really exciting to kind of bring together our, uh, these events and the themes we're working on in LOG. Um, so I'll be discussing uh, or leading a discussion with uh, WXY on their work in relation to this themed issue of LOG that I guest edited titled Expanding Modes of Practice and created along with the fantastic editors at LOG, uh, Cynthia Davidson and Patrick Templeton. Um, and so this issue is about how architectural practice can broaden its tools and methods to address social inequities. And the issue builds on decades of activism and experimental practice in architecture, um, particularly work that is intersectional, so that approaches issues of gender, race, and sexuality, class and ability, as all intertwined and overlapping. 
Um, it looks at practices that slip between urban planning, urban design, activism, architecture, and social practice. So a key theme of expanding modes of practice is really looking at both the systemic and the personal at the same time. So not only large scale structural conditions of inequity, but how they play out in ordinary everyday ways of working, talking, making, and interacting. Um, so it's an attention to the visceral qualities of everyday embodied experience. So some of the contributors, I don't know if you can see because it's so small, but um, we have Ma Mabel Wilson, Peggy Deemer, Feminist Architecture Collaborative, Assemble, L.A. Moss, and the list goes on. Thank you <laughs> for the enlargement. Um, and although the pieces were written um, several months ago, they're becoming, I think, even more relevant now um, as the pandemic has brought such precarity and vulnerability to people around the world. So it's impossible to ignore the scale of suffering at the moment and also the deep inequities in access to resources, care, and opportunity. So it seems more important than ever for architecture to really respond to fundamental needs. Um, so I'm gonna sort of initiate this, this conversation with WXY, but we also wanna hear your thoughts. So you can um, enter questions into the Q&A button, which is at the bottom of your screen, if you bring your cursor down to the bottom. Um, and we'll be sort of bringing those questions together and raising them near the end. We'll have about 15 minutes for those questions. So, so uh, right away. Um, so I wanted to ask Claire and Adam, I wanted to ask you about this question of sort of the systemic and the personal, which I think is really, it's really challenging to address both in a practice, but I think your practice does. So I wanted to hear how you think about that. How do you kind of find ways of analyzing, understanding, hearing about the raw personal dimensions of inequity through your processes and how might those processes need to change now in the era of the pandemic? So we, we had no advance notice of these questions. Um, <laughs> the, I mean, that is a, is a real, um, uh, it's a real, uh, interesting question. You know, a lot of um, the work that um, the planning folks working with some of the designers have been focused on has been around school diversity and um, school integration. And, um, you know, there have been a number of uh, important aspects of assembling staff uh, to do that work that um, are very good communicators, but also are more representative of some of the communities that we are working within. And so really, you know, on a, on a basic level, you know, how um, the, that staff feels prepared, um, how uh, both, you know, Claire and I relate to staff who tend to be younger, tend to be planners of color, um, requires a lot of dialogue. And, you know, it, I'll just be, you know, quite open about that and, and you know, those, uh, staff people who are amazing, Chris Rice in particular, who's been leading a lot of the school's work, um, you know, they're really uh, in some ways out in front of a very tough community audiences even more than we are. And so, you know, the kind of challenges that they're facing and the pressures they're under um, in terms of dealing with complex issues, that's a very uh, sort of uh, overt, obvious instance of where these sort of personal and political issues come together and really finding ways to communicate uh, internally, uh, you know, as part of our staff. We've done a lot of training, uh, external trainers coming in to uh, sort of facilitate. And a lot of that starts with very personal discussions. And, and so that's perhaps the easiest way to, to kick off, you know, what are, what are really challenging issues. Um, I, I think I, I want to add to that a little bit as well in that I think most of us who uh, worked on projects sort of post various crises that involved large numbers of people and crises are not only climate events, crises can be a rezoning, crises can be uh, a neighborhood that's changing, is you have to start I think by treating it personally but also um, being in, I would say, the office, opposite of a, 
patriarchal position that really even the East Harlem Community Plan or the Rockaways, you go in from a position of being able to be a translator, maybe is one of the way, like if you adopt, then you put, then in addition to the many languages that you try and make sure you have the resources for, you have to also kind of look at an advantage I think architects have, which is the ability to draw and be willing to sit down with people and draw what they're saying and then invite them to really draw what they're saying. And I think a lot of the more tactical, whether it's um, done with spaces and places in New Orleans, but in the, the firm in general has a long history in looking at ways of conducting meetings where you, you have your own hat, you declare what your own biases are, but you also have an opportunity to try on someone else's role and really see an opportunity to do things live, which might be digital, as, an oppor as a creative opportunity for everyone, not just the architects, but that there is, and that's really what I was sort of enjoying about reading Log is, you know, about Mabel's work, but also in a number of other articles about this idea that it is an event. Like what we do in, in creating any form of engagement or even architecture is create an event you know? Yeah. And I think what's, you know, it's interesting about your practice and the kind of processes you're talking about is it's obviously drawing a lot from urban planning and urban design, which I think have developed more tools for this kind of work for engagement in recent years than architecture. Um, but then somehow splicing that with processes of making and drawing like you were talking about. Um, can you, for people who sort of don't do those types of processes every day, can you talk a little bit more about what it is that you pull from urban planning and urban design, how you format engagement and how you um, translate what you're learning into architectural design processes? Well, I'll do a quick one and then Adam, I'm gonna, and in a lot of ways, sort of the idea of looking at it really almost like very creatively of who is at the table and in a way, in a way sequencing a, like with the East Harlem Community Plan of creating all of these expert committees where people actually were local experts and they had to self-organize. It takes a lot of work to create a uh, schedule and a meeting where self-organization is actually a thing. So that usually involves really planning meetings where it's more than going around and um, saying your name. In fact, you have prompts and you um, create um, almost exercises for people to do together, but it's really not it's for them to be able to conduct the meetings themselves. So that idea of being, being behind the scenes and really analyzing data, but really with the idea that everyone is a city planner, everyone is an architectural client. Those are, I think, the core of why models, drawings, but also a kind of engagement, quick fire stuff, slow is really important because you, know, you don't want people to feel like it's not for them. Yeah, I mean, I, I think also, you know, the nature of engagement changes uh, depending on, on whether it is a kind of design process that's leading to a very specific design or it's a planning process that is a kind of holistic you know, looking at um, linkages and public health and, and a range of issues. When Claire and I first started working together on something called the East River Blue Way, a lot of the engagement um, was highly specific in the sense like, you know, uh, in terms of what Claire was talking about, um, they, uh, local folks being experts, like, you know, where are you trying to get to on the waterfront? You know, what route would you take to get there? You know, um, what do you do or what would you want to do when you get like, and, and really um, gathering highly specific feedback that then informs the design process. And that in a way is, is different 
than some of the planning processes um, where um, you know the the uh, results are a bit more um, co-creation with planners uh, in that space. You know, in Adam, can I add something about the East River Blueway? So one thing I really learned, and this is really true because Adam valued actually the community not just doing actually saying something they were way ahead of the city from a resiliency point of view and they kind of stopped us in the process because of how we set it up and they said why are why are we waiting to point out that we are in the hundred year floodplain why is this the last chapter and so it there was a real lesson there for me in that the local advocates for whether it was uh, waste hauling or whether it was a cleaner water, actually we're seeing things that maybe architects, planners, and government doesn't see and that there's an opportunity actually for corrective action if you plan that process well. Mm -hmm. And the, the way you're talking about all this, it really sort of challenges assumptions about, you know, authorship and even expertise, who is the expert, who is the author. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, as you kind of produce this really multifaceted collaboration, how have you kind of wrestled with the, or come up against the conventions of the disciplines of what architecture is, what an architect does? Um, you know, have you just sort of said, well, they're not helpful to us, we're gonna leave them behind? Or how have you kind of thought through those questions? I'll let, I'll let Claire go first, because in many ways, like I'm, I trained as an architect, but I really, um, you know, and I feel like I can translate between architects and planners, um, but I'm really the kind of the planner in the office. And so in a way, I, I'm not, um, identifying with the architectural profession in quite the same way. I went back and I did a PhD uh, in planning. Um, and so, um, you know, there, there is a whole range of disciplines in our office and it's perhaps hard to call it a purely, you know, an architectural practice that way. So I think Claire probably does more juggling being more entrenched within the architecture profession than I am. Well, I, I think it's, like I was gonna say that Adam should answer that, but I, I do think that the opportunity to not look at your collaborations as sort of served and the classic architecture way that everyone's helping me do something, and, but to look at an opportunity to see what this sort of critical planning, like, the idea of planning something is no different than a plan in architecture. And once you, I think, start to look at that, then you start to understand that planners and architects both plan and they both have a lot to say to each other in terms of space and time. And one of the things that's been really gratifying in our practice was early exposure to landscape architecture. And I think that really, shifted the practice because, and in particular, I, I always credit Ken Smith for this, that Ken kind of showed me when we were teaching together that architects just assumed time, whereas landscape architects engaged in time. And one thing I really feel is important about planners and architects working together is that planners look at time as actually the main, their main thing, like everything is about time. And, um, and it makes you more self-aware of um, the fact that you don't control everything, but you have, to orchestr you have to orchestrate a dialogue. And in a lot of ways I feel space, the opportunities of public space is exactly that. If you tell everyone, if your public space is telling everyone what they're doing all the time, and then that isn't actually choreographing the beauty of the city and what everyone wants to do. It's that level of control is sometimes what's given architects designing public spaces a kind of uh, bad reputation, I think. I think it's a really wonderful way of talking about it in terms of time. And it makes me think also of historic preservation, which is something that I 
do work with and it's similar you know i've always thought historic preservation and landscape architecture are very similar and that they think in longer time scales um and i wondered for you are you seeing that as actually a way the way that you practice do you see it as sort of a new direction for architecture in general as a way of producing maybe a more site-specific or ethical um practice um is it kind of is there an aspiration to kind of shift maybe the direction of the field or do you see yourself as sort of being in another category? No, I think that the goal, I think Adam, we totally share this with other partners. The goal is actually to expand the field of architecture to understand that really we have the ability, like the built environment is, should include as many of of everyone, as many people as possible, but also as many issues as possible. And that the canvas of the built environment, which is ultimately architecture, um, and ultimately does encapsulate everything is, it, it would be sad if we limited ourselves to the insides and outsides of buildings, but buildings teach us a lot about ourselves. And hopefully, I get, I'm kind of reflecting on why I'm so passionate about preservation and history is that I feel like the physical culture and the built environment and objects still have so much to teach us that we don't even know what they are. And so if anything, I think what, our, what should be appealing to most people is the idea that our field represents, and I really felt this way about the log issue too, is we are resisting erasure right as a field we really want to expose the layers we want to get all of the layers of information into what we design and i you know i think um just grappling with the field of architecture today and you look at the challenges that we have and obviously we're cognizant of the pandemic but also thinking about climate change and you really just can't disconnect architecture from a whole host of social and infrastructural systems. And so it's really impossible for the profession of architecture and its sort of more narrow definition to, to grapple with those challenges. And, and so, you know, the second you want to address something like climate change, you have to confront a whole array of systems. And at the same time, you know, all of our work with the Department of Education right now is on hold because of the crisis we're in. And yet, you know, so much of the issues around school equity is focused on remote learning. And there have been so many people saying, well, you know, now, you know, we can give out devices and people have smartphones, but actually, you know, the issues with remote learning are so intertwined with uh, social systems and architectural issues, you know, someone suddenly has to create, you know, two or three classrooms in their apartments for, you know, for multiple children. And it's not just a matter of being able to connect to the internet. And, you know, and, and so, you know, all of these uh, issues, the architecture of apartment buildings, which are now serving as the social infrastructure that schools once served, you know, is in, intertwined with so many other uh, systems. So, you know, if, if architecture is gonna grapple with, with real challenges, it's gonna bump up against uh, a whole host of other systems. And so I, you know, I'm perhaps less focused on moving architecture as a profession and just really sort of grappling with the challenges of, of urbanism. And that requires many, many hands. I think that connects to something that I thought was interesting from your presentation just now about communication that you were talking about, you know, modes of representation that were useful for communicating with parents or, you know, multiple stakeholders in any project. So on the one hand, I'm, I'm curious about how you feel like you have developed a toolkit for yourselves in order to be able to reach uh, non architectural or planning audiences and then how you think that might need to shift now in order to become more virtual. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, I mean, I, you know, I think everything we're doing is work in progress and, and you know, we've definitely been very um, focused on making information and data 
uh, more transparent and clear to people and simple and, and more understandable and able to like uh, sort of like pinpoint certain problems and dilemmas that exist and making those things clear to people make people say, okay, there's a challenge and we're not gonna know what the solution is, but we have to address that. Um, but there's still more that we need to do that goes beyond data into like real storytelling and pulling out narrative. And that's, you know, something that easily lends itself into the virtual and digital realm. And so, you know, our hope is that if uh, we do wind up doing more virtual engagement, we did have a session about a month ago in Maryland, a virtual town hall with students around issues of, of um, school utilization and diversity, but that we can start to use sessions that um, not only sort of illustrate uh, data, but also start to pull out narratives. And so some of that may be, because people can be hard to reach, is more sort of one-on-one -on -one or small group uh, sessions that then can be reflected out to wider audiences. And so we're, you know, we are like deep in a mode and we had a kind of internal seminar today about like, what can we do uh, in terms of digital and virtual engagement? So yeah, it is a kind of a next big challenge. So um, Adam, I'm noticing there's some questions that could relate to, okay. so we're being asked also, you know, in terms of the equity training that, uh, that we A, had to do, but also was, was the opportunity of working with Department of Education, um, that effort, which is D15, required our entire office, which at the time I think was 35 people. It was sort of an all hands on deck, which means that many architects who had never even had a planning class in architecture school actually were in a position of having to take equity training and and our um, Chris Rice led it, but people really, in a way, got an opportunity within the office to see what it was like to kind of go through a planning process. And some of them, you know, obviously this was new to them because they didn't even have kids. Some of them did have kids. So that was kind of the answer to that question. And then the other question, Adam, which I don't know if you would be, I, you can yeah. totally answer, which is how did we get D15? Yeah. Yeah, well, that's an interesting one because um, uh, the connection was really through the community engagement work that we did in East Harlem. Like that was the immediate connection where um, people in the Department of Education, some of whom have had careers outside of education, uh, began to look for alternatives to the way uh, typical departments were dealing with engagement. And so they saw the East Harlem neighborhood uh, planning work and contacted us. You know, as it happened, um, my PhD looked at schools uh, very specifically and looked at the impact that school assignment and admissions policies were having on neighborhoods. And my whole mantra with the school's work is that school assignment um, is really about shaping neighborhoods and cities as opposed to just shaping schools. And so we had already done work uh, with Boston Public Schools and a few other places as well. So for us, it was really bringing together knowledge and thinking about social infrastructure and schools and neighborhoods uh, together with engagement practices. Um, so yeah, that, that was really how we wound up uh, getting, getting involved. So feel free to send in more questions. So it's, they're good prompts. Um, I was interested to hear you talking about this idea of narrative. Um, because I feel like what you're describing is almost a transition from the kind of quantitative data that you gather into something that is more abstract or even fictional or, you know, fictionalized or something that's in a format that is more interpretive. Um, and so how do you, I guess that speaks to another thing you mentioned earlier about this transition from the kind of planning processes to a design process. How do you wrestle with that, that moment of abstraction and interpretation? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll go first on that. And it's interesting that Claire talked about time and, you know, the easiest narrative to tap into is historical narrative and, and the way a place has changed. And in the context of, you know, East Harlem and District 15, those narratives of change are really, really powerful. 
in District 15, and it's, you know, it's different in every district in New York City. They're not all the same, but District 15 had shifted rapidly in 10 years because of some new um, admissions policies that had come up during the Bloomberg administration. And so rather than it being a kind of 60 year or a longer history, it was actually a 10 year snapshot that when we really told the story of changes in certain schools, and, and those stories were database, but they were also very personal, you know, where, you know, kids who, uh, who had traditionally gone to a certain school that was, you know, by um, a certain housing, you know, were no longer being able to get into those schools because of the kinds of policies that were being put in place. So the historical narrative, both through personal lenses and through information and data, uh, were really, really effective in saying, okay, like, Look at, look at what's happened here. Um, but there are definitely other ways of, of addressing narrative too. So Claire, let you jump in. Well, I mean, it, it relates a little bit to how is this connected to even designing a school or designing a classroom? And I think I would offer that, you know, uh, Adam first, we first met because actually Adam was working with the community in Hunts Point. And um, Adam's background had always been in, he started a summer camp and in, in interest in education, this is before he went to England. And we worked together on um, an opportunity to do a new charter school that ended up being, I think probably the most important, our, important first project, which was Bronx Charter School for the Arts, which still exists, still amazing, which is the idea of an arts-based school. But um, in order to design it, he uh, got a grant and brought teachers and students together. And we basically drew up the plan that represented a set of ideas and through using paper and stuff that they all voted for and decided what to do. And I think that um, it then required a narrative about, which in this case was arts first, I think, right? It was like an art. It required a narrative because the site actually had, no, had only one facade that allowed windows. So you had to make a choice which rooms got windows. And it turns out only theater and dance visual arts and music got the windows and everyone else had to share skylights. So there was essentially that narrative that Adam had been researching in where that there's a long tradition of schools being in a lot of other buildings. In this case, it was a salami factory. But like, so in the, when we finally got to open the school, it opened with an exhibition that Adam designed that really traced this idea of uh, schools reflecting a kind of economic model so that you know at one point were schools trying to educate factory workers and then schools wanted to educate office workers and then at what point so where we are today I think is very much this work is connected to an idea of reading through people and a reading of place and that that space that the art of architecture is up to that task I guess because it's essentially nonverbal as well. So it can handle narrative. Right, yeah. Well, I'd love to see that exhibition in whatever part. I, I, we have some pictures of it. Do you still have it, Adam? Uh, there's some photos, yeah. Um, and, and, you know, just to circle back to the practice, I mean, that was really the sort of first collaboration I had with Claire. And, um, you know, I wasn't at, uh, the practice then. This was 2003, I think. And um, for me, it was kind of astonishing to run, uh, you know, facilitate this engagement practice and then to have this architect just do exactly what people said. And so for me, it was like, okay, this is a really, you know, deeply collaborative and a really good uh, listener. Um, and so that to me, and this is, uh, you know, just sort of fundamental to what I would want in, in a collaborator and a partner. So that, that was um, really indicative of the way Claire works. And I think very different than a lot of architects. So, you know, it was, uh, it was a great, great moment. 
And so I guess to them, the, you know, the harder question of how do you continue this process now? Like, what are your thoughts on ways of doing engagement and constructing narratives when you can't be in the same place? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, and one, we, you know, we have a bigger staff now. And so we, we've got people who are feeding us new ideas and, and you know, 99% of that is good, but also, you know, reaching a kind of common understanding of what the role of a facilitator is and how that balances against advocacy and, and other issues, how design vision enters the frame and, as opposed to something that's, you know, uh, completely process based. So those questions, um, when more people are into the process, get more complicated, but they also get richer. You know, the ways in which we can use and are using other uh, forms of media and other forms of data analysis. You know, we're developing a tool for a project where people will really be able to experience data in a much uh, more profound way uh, than if we're simply, you know, presenting flat slides. Um, and so we've got, you know, people who, you know, are working in GIS and Python and, and design media to make things uh, very interactive. So that's, that will be a big new step for us. I mean, I think this is, there's a kind of fundamental question we all have, which is how working in a digital space, a lot of what you make and do can lie about a reality, right? And people are worried about being manipulated yeah. in this, you know, digital community, right? Their emotions being manipulated, the data. And I think that's um, the thing that in a way the practice also has really, really tried to stay true to the idea that in a way we're neutral and we're like detectives and explorers and we're trying to go along with everyone else and find things like as though they're assuming there are things to be found. There's nuggets of knowledge to be found. But it, what's really challenging is there's going to be and there is already so much out there that may actually be obscuring truths, maybe telling can't, like stories that are not in fact real. And I think we're all kind of worried about um, how to set up um, kind of engagement and projects in a way that could still continue with this idea that we're not prejudging things. We're not just advocating for one thing or the other. We're trying to find um, find people's voices in it. Yeah, and that uh, you know, I think this idea you know that Jane Jacobs raised in that quote is that we want everybody to feel like proprietors. We want people to to own the information and not feel like we're feeding it to them. And that's hard, you know, especially you know if we get associated with certain kinds of policies or certain kinds of designs. So there's another question that popped up about density. You know, I think there's a lot of writing out there and it's true about how even denser cities, whether it's Hong Kong or um, uh, Taipei or uh, Seoul have done much better than we have. And they have actually much denser um, buildings and a much denser environment and more people living together. And I think it does get to the fact that we, there's so much about policy that you can see in the work that Adam is describing about getting people to understand what's at stake and how to relate to each other, that actually it's much more about how we all make decisions together that then built form can come out of than literally prejudging one type of living or another, you know, that, that in, in a lot of ways, we've left policy to politicians, even if when that policy basically ends up being um, its success or failure depends on the physical environment, or not, or the physical environment plays no role, and the policy is counter to that. So what I would say is that, and what I'm noticing, uh, Laura, about uh, work now is that individual voices, whether it's uh, people you work with on staff, whether it's um, 
other experts and even all of us on a Zoom call is that we actually are represented as individuals. So if we figure out the right ways to do it, we won't have the problems you have with, you know, group think or the fact that the, uh, an engineer who actually has figured something out gets drowned out by other voices. So maybe there's a huge advantage in, in how, in working this way. I mean, I think to the question about density, there's, there's going to be so many lessons and pieces of information that we take away. And again, you know, what is, uh, what are they doing in Hong Kong or Taiwan or Seoul, Korea? And, you know, I'm just starting to hear these stories about, you know, when uh, people were first asked to isolate in Taiwan, you know, they would um, get like a care package, you know, with like food and video games and things, you know, and, and so there was a process of like, like encouraging that. And, you know, and then there's the sort of privacy challenges that we have here that they're um, for a whole host of reasons, you know, they, if someone turns off their phone, you know, nobody knows where they are and, and they'll get a knock on the door. And, and so they're really using phone devices to sort of track people and track people who have been infected. And, and so, you know, those uh, privacy issues here, and there are probably privacy issues there as well, are things that we need to grapple with. And, and some of it does relate to sense of trust and ownership uh, and social cohesion. And so we've just got a, we've got a long way to go to figure out why New York City has been has been hit so hard um and and i i don't think it is just a matter of of density and you know but that's something that needs to be studied mm -hmm. we also have another question from cynthia davidson um she says claire you've mentioned data several times who compiles the data that you analyze where does it come from i think that both uh adam i and will um answer that, but New York City, a lot of our work is in the Northeast so far, whether it's Boston, Maryland, or New York, and we happen to, the cities and states happen to um, have, in terms of geospatial information, it's really rich. It tends to be mostly publicly available. And, you know, you, even our city planning department from a 3D spatialization has a lot of accessible data. So it's really a question of having a pretty interdisciplinary group, but you know, in the case of the DOE stuff, even people outside who can suggest how to write kind of the right algorithm to look at data. And I think Adam will get into that more deeply, but I think what's really challenging is working in places where there isn't that demographic, data available and you know we've worked with um, ACS before which is children's services and there's a lot of difficulty getting data to understand for example in the foster system you have to go through a lot a lot of data is confidential even if you're completely um, making it anonymous when you use it because what you're really looking for is to understand if for example in schools if if being late because you have to commute so far, does that also impact what school you then get into? Or does that impact a child's uh, attitude towards school? So, you know, there's so many issues that it's really important to understand all, how all of those different facts add up. So Adam, um, I kind of ran on there too long, but go for it. No, I mean, um, you know, some of the work we're doing, particularly around schools, we're getting confidential data sets that, you know, is uh, geocoded information about students. And there's a lot of information linked to those students. We don't see their names, but we have, you know, where they live and, and, and things tied to socioeconomics and, and race and, um, and a whole array of things. So that allows us to do a lot. But one, one interesting story from the East Harlem neighborhood plan, the most critical data we got was actually scraped from a website by this, you know, kind of um, data whiz guy, and I'm forgetting his name, but it was really important information in the context of East Harlem. What he was able to do 
was essentially scrape information that showed um, when all of the housing subsidies um, were going to time out, were going to run out in East Harlem. So in East Harlem, 80% of the people at the time of that work lived in uh, subsidized housing, of which half was NYCHA, and the other half were programs that would last for five more years, 10 more years, Michelama type, type things. And what that data set allowed us to do was to show the people in East Harlem how much affordable housing they were going to lose every year as these subsidies timed out. And it turned out to be around 300 units of affordable housing every year. So when it came to talking about rezoning and new density under mandatory inclusionary housing, we were able to say, look, if you want to try and replace that affordable housing that's going to be lost to subsidies, these are the kinds of densities that you'd want to look at in these areas. And we were really able to kind of option that out um, with people in a way that was very clear cut. They had a real number in front of them. And that data came from someone who had, who had you know, managed to really scrape it off a website, which was very interesting. Yeah, it's great to get the sort of specific examples of how you make this work. So we actually, unfortunately, have to wrap up in a minute, but um, it was so great to hear both sort of the nuts and bolts, you know, looking under the hood of how you run your practice. I have a thousand more questions I would love to ask you, but that <laughs> should be for another time. And then also just to hear about the kind of larger scale ambitions for the field. So thank you so much for thank you, everyone. sharing your thoughts. Um, I just want to say a huge thank you to Clara and Adam and Brian. That was a fascinating discussion, a, a fantastic um, launch for this new series of programs. I mean, to un the stimulating conversation about the power of listening to a wide variety of voices about reconceiving what the nature of collaboration is and can be and what architectural services are and can be um, and the importance of openness to a much wider variety of, of inputs to the creative process. I mean, it's a huge amount of things to think about. Um, this event was recorded. Um, we are gonna be posting um, it on the league website as soon as we can figure out, um, get it in shape and figure out how to do that. And then we're gonna be continuing to explore these themes of expanding um, modes of practice over the next couple of months in our um, our new collaboration with LOG on this um, issues and and Brian will be working with us in forthcoming um, programs. For all of you who are listening, we would love to have your comments and suggestions about how we can improve the experience of this if you have ideas um, for this. Um, so please send them to info at archleague.org. Looks like we all suddenly got a huge number of um, new questions, which we will pass on. Uh, we'll make sure that the panelists, uh, that Claire and Adam are aware of the questions and maybe we can find a way in the posting of the program when we do that to, to get some answers to those. So. Thank you all very, very much. I hope everybody has um, a great weekend or as good a weekend as it's possible in our um, strange circumstances to have. And that just repeat again that um, if you, that you can send uh, both suggestions and questions and comments to info at archleague.org. Thank you all. Thank you everyone. Thank you.